If you're not in Shiba Inu, you feel like you missed out on the boat. Like everyone is getting rich and yachts and this and that, and you're broke, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in my opinion, if your portfolio is safe and you have like a long-term vision, then use that 5%, use that 3%, use that 1% of your portfolio and put it into Shiba Inu. It would likely uh, crash and burn and, and you will probably lose it, but it was fun and it, it kind of um, gave you this opportunity to live through that FOMO moment. Good morning and welcome to DeFire, the podcast that gives me the carte blanche to ask the smartest girls and boys in the world of crypto the questions for us, the often overlooked mid-IQ bell curve people. My name is Jonas and today on the show I got to interview a local crypto powerhouse, Feyas Alingan. Fresh Fey, as he is known on Twitter, is the driving force and founder of Blue Alpine Research a German-speaking crypto community, research and educational company. However, you may recognize his voice from somewhere else. Feyas is a regular guest on Kevin Rose's Modern Finance podcast, probably one of the biggest crypto podcasts out there, and definitely one of my favorite. Feyas is a regular guest and contributor, so when I found out that Feyas is living in the same city as I am, I had to get in touch with him and ask him how he did it. In our wide-ranging conversation, we also talk about how he started investing in crypto, where we are in this cycle, and whether or not you should invest in Shiba Inu. Please enjoy my conversation with Feyas Alingan. So let's start the show. Okay. Und ich bin jetzt auch nicht äh, der größte Podcast, wo du schon je drauf äh, erschienen bist. Yeah. <lacht> ja, das ist jetzt natürlich ein gemeiner Vergleich mit dem Kevin, aber ähm, nicht wegen dem, <lacht> sondern ich. Welcome to the show, Feyas. Um, and I wanted to start with actually congratulating you to your fatherhood. You Thank recently you so much. just became a dad. Yes, yes. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, that's why. I mean, the people on the on the podcast can cannot see me, but the the eyes do look tired. Definitely, uh, sleep is is a scare resource these days. But um, I am making the most out of it and enjoying every minute. And since you are like a professional crypto connoisseur and uh, investor, using now the wonder of life, how did that change your perspective on crypto, if at all? Well, let's let's say like this: when when my daughter was born, essentially one or two weeks, I was completely not off the grid, but I I didn't look at any crypto prices, any crypto news, and all of these things. So it puts the priorities uh, straight. Um, it forces you to focus on what's really important in life. And for me, this is definitely my family and uh, the well-being of my daughter right now. So it's not only me and, and or my wife right now. So it's it's a baby that is completely dependent on you. So it makes you think and, and question all of the things where you waste time as well. So no time wasting allowed anymore. Okay, I think that touched on a good point. I mean, what do you do on your day-to-day -day basis? Or asking differently, could you introduce yourself? What are you doing? How would you present yourself? Sure. My name is Feyas. I'm I'm from from Basel originally, but I live in Zurich, and um, I talk about cryptocurrencies essentially. So I have started um, a small YouTube channel a couple of years ago where I started doing a fundamental analysis research because I felt like the market was lacking something that was looking behind the charts and behind the hype. So for me, it was always a goal to, uh, on, on a very authentic and transparent level, uh, introduce people to cryptocurrencies, to this new investable asset, um, to, to different topics like DeFi and NFTs, and um, just explain them kind of what it really is, how it works, and whether um, it is investable or not. And of course, sometimes there are some hypes uh, where the prices go up, And, and so on and so forth. And through that idea, um, Blue Alpine Research was born. So the main component was always a research element. Previously, this was in written format. Nowadays, it's more videos that I'm doing for the YouTube channel, um, as well as an online course to introduce people from A to Z, for example, to DeFi, um, as well as a community. 
So right now I have a community and, and by the way, this is all done in German. So for the German speaking countries. So originally I started in English, but realized that there was higher demand in the German speaking space. So I switched completely to German. So my entire content is in German these days. And um, besides doing the videos, I also do a daily podcast summarizing crypto news every day um, between five to 10 minutes and um, trying to really uh, bring value to my community, to my subscribers, to my followers, to my email list and, and so on and so forth and try to give them a perspective that, in my opinion, is still lacking in this space. Mm -hmm. You are living in the same city as I am. Um, we are both living in Zurich. We have never met in real life. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is, and I have to confess that uh, a friend of mine once sent me, um, I think an ad on, on, on Instagram with a, like a, a webinar that you did with Swissquote, which is like a Swiss company where you can buy and sell crypto, but also shares. And I was kind of dismissing it. Ah, I mean, what can I learn from from this person? Uh, it's kind of an introduction into, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, crypto, uh, and it didn't really look into it. And then I started to listening to that podcast by Kevin Rose, um, who is a huge character in the US. He's like a very well-known uh, investor, entrepreneur, and recently really started to get big into crypto as well, or or maybe since a long time, actually. And you are a guest there on, on that uh, podcast, or not, not just a guest, you, you are a regular contributor. Mm -hmm. Tell me the story. How does, did that happen? That, I find that super fascinating. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting story. So uh, as many, and, and probably you as well, I have been a follower of uh, Kevin Rose's for quite some time. So I think it started maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, because he was always producing content or doing podcasts or videos and more importantly, releasing applications, apps and, and different platforms. So previously I was, I was working, I studied electrical engineering, but I started working as a product manager. So products and kind of digital products, be it mobile and web pro products were always kind of my, my focus. And, um, As a product person, you have to keep up to date with different products. You have to play around with everything that is out there to understand what is working, what is not working, what kind of patterns can you use in order to build these into your own products as well. And I think Kevin is, is one of the best product people, if not the best, in my opinion. He has this eye and hunch for good products and, and builds them in, in a way that um, make people fall in love with the product itself. And I always appreciated that a lot about Kevin Rose. So he was always this guy that you would follow in the product uh, area. Now, um, back in 2011 and 2012, I want to say, he tweeted uh, about this thing called Coinbase. He was like, yeah, sign up with my referral link and get some BTC. And back then, BTC was, I mean, Bitcoin, obviously, is, is, was something very foreign for me. Uh, I, I remember in 2011, I quickly looked at BTC. Back then, the price was, I think, around 10 US dollars. That was before the big run up to 100 US dollars. And I asked a lot of people in my circle whether I should invest into something called Bitcoin. Um, I wanted to invest a couple of thousand francs and this and that. And everyone told me, don't touch this at all. Like, this is a scam. <laughs> oh. This this will never work. Uh, it's not oh. based on anything. Um, and fast forward, that was um, that mistake or let's not call it a mistake, but that um, not investing cost me a couple of, um, let's say, million, depending on when, when I would have effectively invested. Um, and then jumping to 2012, I was like, okay, if I can get these BTC for free, why not? I mean, I would sign up because this Coinbase stuff looks interesting. It, it had a really nice UX. Even back then, Coinbase was, in my opinion, and still is one of the best um, UX products in the crypto space. And I think that's also the reason why they've become so big. So I signed up um, with Kevin's referral link. Um, got my BTC uh, as, as a referral. I think it was 0.1 or something like this. Um, and used that referral link myself to refer it to other people as well. 
So through my link and through Twitter, people signed up um, and then used essentially my my, my links to to generate BTC. And um, like like you, I have been a follower of, of Kevin since um, he has released his Modern Finance podcast. I think this year or a couple of months ago, and. Um, he was looking for people who could potentially help him out with newsletters or with podcasts, with guests and this and that. And I was first dismissing the idea. I was like, ah, this is not, nothing for me. I, I would probably like, I would go under in the sea of emails that he would probably receive. And then my friend told me about the email as well. Uh, yeah? A quick question. So how did you know that he was looking for people? Did he just tweet out, hey, I'm looking for someone? To his 1.5 million Twitter followers. He's, no, he sent out an email. <laughs> he sent out an email saying, um, would you like to help me out with modern finance? And then he said, I'm looking for this and I'm looking for that, essentially. So it was a, I was signed up for the newsletter as well. And um, and by the way, guys, this is, this is such an important part. Like I said, try out all the products, sign up for all the newsletters, follow the people that you like on Twitter and then just follow them and follow up with them as well. I think this is super important important if you want to get ahead in, in specific industries and so on. Hmm. Um, so I emailed him after my friend told me about this opportunity as well, because I was like, it would be stupid of me not to try. So let's mm -hmm. just try it. I, I needed a catchy subject line and I, I wrote him, thanks for BTC in 2012. That was the subject line. And I think oh, this got great. him to, to open, open the subject line. I explained to him that he was essentially the reason why I started in crypto because that BTC that I got was the base for my portfolio today. That 0 0.1 that you got when you signed up and then when you uh, earned more Bitcoin by other people kind of signing up through your exactly. uh, referral link. Yeah, exactly. Just because... to have an idea, how, how much back in the days when, I mean, you have now one, 1,600 followers or something like that. And in 2012, I don't know how many you had, but how many people do you onboard? Not, not a remember? lot, not a lot, maybe 10 or something. Uh, maybe it was eight or 10 people. It wasn't a lot. And the thing is, you wouldn't mm. get uh, the BTC for every sign up. Some people clicked on the link, but not everyone signed up. So essentially, um, I lost some people in the conversion there, but it's all good because I took this um, small BTC amount and then in 2016, when I saw Ethereum, I was like, I'm not going to miss the boat again because in the meantime, Bitcoin made this crazy jump and back down and so on and so forth. So I saw Ethereum at 12 US dollars and then that's when I pulled the trigger. And like I said, this was kind of the shifting of the portfolio from BTC to ETH in, in 2016 to then participate in 2017 from the, let's say, the ICO boom. Wow. And did you, um, now we're maybe a little bit off track because we're already going kind of in, into prices and stuff, but just wondering, because I, I, I started at the same time, 2016, around $10 uh, average buying price with Ethereum. And obviously mm -hmm. I just put in like a couple of hundred bucks, uh, not, not major money. I mean, I didn't have time, mm -hmm. money at the time. Um, but did you then... The crash, the winter that came after the boom, did you did you sell off or did you huddle through it? Because uh, I really, I huddled through it, but it, it was really painful and uh, I, I don't mm -hmm. want to make the same mistake again. And I'm saying this now because uh, later I want to talk about where we stand right now in the cycle and mm -hmm. maybe we can draw some parallels. Mm -hmm. um, no, it was, I, I'm not sure whether it was good or bad, but I sold much earlier. I sold at around 400 so before this craziness to a thousand happened in 2017, I sold off in, in that summer before. So that was mm -hmm. kind of my first, because I felt like this was such a good performance and I needed some cash. So I sold that part as well. Um, so that, that's where, where I cashed it in, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. And then unfortunately, and looking back, this was obviously a mistake, but unfortunately I had to um, participate with a much, much smaller amount in the 2017 craziness that was going on. So I had to kind of rebuild uh, the portfolio from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's the Kevin Rose story. That's interesting. So basically just don't be mm -hmm. shy, apply, um, reach out to the, your idols, talk to people. Yes, That's absolutely. how I get my guests on the podcast as well. Although it's, it's a lot of work to get these people on, get people to no notice you and yeah. kind of 
Do you? I mean, th that's the thing. Yeah. I, I had to follow up with him as well. I think he he answered um, within two or three days. But um, after after I answered him, I didn't get an email for two weeks or something. And I thought this was the last opportunity. Essentially, he liked the message. He wanted to have a quick call to sit down to kind of understand where we are both. And um, I felt like, okay, this was it. Like this was probably going nowhere. Um, this was my shot. I tried it. Great. But essentially, I had to follow up as well. And I think this is super mm -hmm. important because these guys are, are super busy. Like these guys are getting thousands and thousands of emails and DMs all day, every day. And mm -hmm. you have to see that the bigger your Twitter followers and so on, and you mentioned he has one and a half million followers. So it, it's very difficult to, to go through that, those and see where valuable uh, connections are and, and valuable or, or interesting projects lie and where not. And now comparing this podcast, I mean, is, is, it, is it different than what we are doing right now uh, in terms of like process, uh, preparation, um, I think you've been on like three or four times already on his podcast. Mm -hmm. Is is there something that that you would say you learned for your own podcast or that you would, you know, could share with me that I could learn or the listeners that might be interested in that as well? Um, so what, what, what I forgot when, when I first sat down with Kevin and we talked about potentially doing an episode was that Kevin has about... 15 if not 20 years of experience of being a content creator being in front of the camera being a moderator um, and and being a podcaster as well he was one in my opinion one of the first guys who who took this podcast format and and um, really perfectioned it by having really interesting guests and being a really good listener and interviewer as well um, so i realized that quickly when he told me that that um, what kind of topics do you have for our podcast episode? And I want to get in and I want to explain all the details and why this is cool and why I'm seeing this and that and so on. And he stopped me there after the maybe second sentence as he said, okay, that's great. Keep those topics in mind and let's discuss them in the podcast so you don't share the juicy bits because as soon as you share the juicy bits, I tell you something, you ask me about it, and this is already a super interesting question that you asked me and could be very interesting for the listener as well. So we keep, we just talk about kind of like general outlook on and topics that, that we would mm -hmm. like to mention, that we are seeing, that are interesting. And then afterwards, we just let the conversation flow. And I think this was super helpful also for me, for my own podcast, and also for the future interviews that I'm giving. Mm -hmm. And I, I found this so funny because one of the latest episodes, which I thought was really great, um, he kind of quickly shared the story where he sold his Fidenza for like 777 ETH. And, and, and you didn't really know what to say or there was like not really a reaction coming from you. And I was wondering like, how how is that? Like, how, how are you peers? Because I didn't understand he never introduced you or something or what your relation is. So I figured, is that just normal or um, how do you re react if somebody, I mean, obviously he's already super rich anyways, but that's still crazy. Uh, mm. And I think it was probably the highest Fidenza sale um, I think ever. to date, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, it was the highest. And I think that that's a funny part. I mean, he was just as surprised as the listeners, in my opinion. But for him, I think these numbers are more normal than... For the normies, for us, let's say, um, mm -hmm. in in my opinion, I mean, I was shocked, but obviously I knew the number when it happened. So I, I was following, I think the, the Fidenza bot or I saw it on Twitter somewhere. So I knew it was his sale that, that was going on. And we talked about this one uh, earlier. Um, that was the reason why I didn't show like a big reaction to it. But essentially for me, it's just, um, and that's that's the perspective I'm trying to give to the listener I am the normie and he's the influence or I am the, the guy who is really getting into NFTs and he is the absolute expert on it. So what I'm trying to do is for the listeners, I'm trying to extract his process. I'm trying to understand how does he proceed with these projects? Does he mm -hmm. only buy one? Does he buy three? At what price does he mint? Does he go to the secondary market? What kind of marketplaces does he check out? Is he looking at the artist or is he looking at the artwork? All of these questions, I think, are 
um, important questions that a lot of NFT investors, it's now specifically talking about NFTs, um, are not aware of. So you need to understand the market dynamics in order to have those crazy sales. And he is one, um, he's, he's a person who has really kind of perfected this process just by being in the space. I, uh, don't forget, he bought CryptoPunks when they first came out, essentially. He had, I think, if not 10 CryptoPunks yet. He still holds like five mm. or six CryptoPunks. I think they were basically free, right? You could just like sell, um, use a smart contract and get as many exactly. as you wanted. Yeah, exactly. I think only gas fee or something, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, it's mm. a crazy world. Uh, and and that's actually what, what, what I th find so interesting in, in the space as well. I think it just writes so many interesting stories besides the number go up and, you know, like analyzing a, a token just maybe as you would the stock, which I believe is also a little bit your background, the stock market as well, right? Um, I think those kind of cultural shifts that, ha that are happening right now with NFTs, um, with meme coins, all that stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. you can have mixed feelings about them. Uh, personally, I don't really like, for instance, meme coins. But I think it's super interesting, and it, it's just uh, mm -hmm. some something is happening. You know, what is what? What did you then after that uh, initial Bitcoin um, enthusiasm and then switching to Ethereum? What kept you in the game? What kept you kind of like digging deeper? That's a good question. Um, because like like you, the, the price correction of the beginning of 2018 hit everyone really hard. Like nobody, we were coming from such a hype cycle that we thought this was just temporary. Everyone was thinking the number will go back up. Like there is just no way. We've just had the craziest three months of our lives in terms of numbers. Everything, like just to, to explain how crazy it was, every day, you opened coin market cap between October and December in 2017, your, the numbers went green, sometimes double digit in one day. And it was just, for us, this was just the normal way of, of um, do, going ab about these things. And kind of being in shock um, that what, what, what happened with the prices, we felt like, or I felt like the best thing I can do right now is just... Um, prepare for the next cycle and and analyze uh, projects that really have the fundamentals because when you're in a high hype cycle um and when every coin is going up you have this incredible feeling of fomo you have the feeling that you need to buy an nft you need to farm DeFi, you need to invest into altcoins you need to buy meme coins like you have all of these crazy opportunities in front of you so that you're if you're not 24 seven wired and now I cannot do this because I have a baby at home, um, mm -hmm. you feel like you're missing out specific things in the industry. And I felt like this was just a really good time to calm down a bit, um, to understand where are we in this market? What has potential? What doesn't? Because now, I mean, when the prices go down, the interest goes down as well um, mm -hmm. with, with time. So I was just uh, putting my head down and, and researching projects for potentially the next hype and just producing content, talking about cryptocurrencies, trying to understand the market a bit better, like what just happened. A lot of uh, uh, PTSD, obviously, um, from, from this crazy market in 2017. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But, but so then you held like regular jobs in, in that period, but at, on the side you were starting to build your your content with the goal i guess to one day go full-time content creator or i don't know how you say it it's like crypto influencer or educator maybe is the best word um yeah but you have a, ed, ed, definitely an, 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 an entrepreneurial uh interest behind this right it's 100 100 percent. i think this was always um i i was always a guy who had uh, many side projects and um because i was either bored on my in my day job or i um felt like i needed something of my own i think a lot of entrepreneurs have that that they have this project or this this um idea that they would like to build and build it exactly how they envision it and for me, um, Blue Alpine Research was exactly that because in, um, in 2007, I wrote a high school um, 
paper, if you want to call it. It's called Matura Arbeit. So it's like the finishing paper that you write for finishing high school. I wrote about um, how to successfully invest into uh, stocks, into the stock market. Mm -hmm. And uh, keep in mind, this was just before, like six months before the markets broke down completely. And mm -hmm. um, since then, I've, I've played around with that idea of um, being able to analyze stocks and, and see uh, specific opportunities in the markets. This was always super interesting for me, although I was always working in technology startups and in technology companies. The finance market had this weird appeal. But with crypto, I was able to combine these two things like financial markets, technology and business as well. And um, this was essentially then uh, how or how I envisioned it to, to become like either a research company or an education company. And luckily, I am in a position now to do both, um, to do both an, an analysis um, on, a, on a weekly basis, also for some private companies as well, as well as do education in terms of um, educating people and teaching people about these topics. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's... Um... Also, the way you talk, you know, and uh, your, your podcast, your, your your way of being is this like calm, analyzing um, person that doesn't really believe in in hypes too much or, or that looks at it with a critical eye. Um, and I think that's also reflected in the name Blue Alpine Research. Mm. Uh, but now, what I, th I think is super interesting, and probably didn't know it back then when I started that company or this project that the world is, you know, um, the influencers are absolutely crazy. You go full manga, uh, post controversial stuff. It's all about mm -hmm. um, memes. Um, it's this more informal way of communicating mm -hmm. online. Um, mm -hmm. How how do you, do you have a little bit of this, uh, and they call themselves degenerates, the D-Chan. Do you have a little bit of this D-Chan soul in you as well? That's, I mean, that's that's an interesting one. I would say the degens in the crypto world and the crypto influencers are two different personalities. So the, the degen, which I know and you know from the DeFi world is just, or from the altcoin world is uh, so-called aping into projects and just blindly buying stuff in hopes that it will go up. Um, from time to time, I do have that. Obviously, I have a community and people ask me, should I buy this meme coin? Should I put uh, X amount into Y? And for me, it's always, look, are your bases covered? Is your portfolio safe? Uh, is like 99% or 95% of your money in assets where you can sleep um, at night without like being super worried? And if the answer is yes, I don't see a problem with gambling. And it is gambling. I mean... The, being the, the, a degen or aping into projects is nothing nothing else than than gambling. Let's be honest here. Mm. Um, and then gambling, this part, this little part, in my opinion, is okay because you can also combat FOMO a bit as well. I mean, for example, Shiba Inu. Mm -hmm. um, at this day and age, everyone is talking about Shiba Inu. The market yesterday was completely red. Shiba Inu was literally the only coin that went up double digits. Um, now. If you're not in Shiba Inu, you feel like you missed out on the boat. Like everyone is getting rich and yachts and this and that, and you're broke, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in my opinion, if your portfolio is safe and you have like a long-term vision, then use that 5%, use that 3%, use that 1% of your portfolio and put it into Shiba Inu. It would likely uh, crash and burn and, and you will probably lose it, but it was fun and it, it kind of um, gave you this... Uh, opportunity to to live through that FOMO moment, let's say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I maybe I'm, I'm also in the process of looking at it a little bit differently. Um, but I kind of had a resentment against mm -hmm. kind of those coins mm -hmm. because I feel like they reflect badly on the whole market. If there's like a meme coin in, that is 35 billion you know, with market cap of 35 billion, which is like a meme coin of a meme coin, which is the ERC-20 token, 20, right? I think. Yes. Yeah. So it's like built on top of Ethereum and it's just a coin that doesn't really have a utility. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It just, I just, I always thought that, ah, that's like, that's like a sign for me to get out. And um, uh, maybe uh, it would be interesting now to talk about where do you see where we are in, in the moment? Because I'm thinking more and more about selling Uh, and as a long time hodler since 2016, 
Mm-hmm. I don't want to repeat the same mistake as I have done, but it's so hard to sell because emotionally it's, you always have this other leg up, this, you know, it mm-hmm. could double again even from now. Um, so do, do you, you have the feeling, do you have the feeling of exiting all the markets and then just turning your back to the crypto market? Is that kind of the feeling that you have? Because sometimes I do have that when I see, mm-hmm. and you, you asked about crypto influences as well. Sometimes I, when I see the, these other content creators, I feel like, man, I'm in the same pot as these guys. These guys are screaming Lambo today, McDonald's tomorrow. And um, it's, <laughs> it, it just doesn't have any consistency. It's, it has no, no educational value whatsoever. It's pure entertainment. And the mm-hmm. worst thing is these guys are luring people into their affiliate links or into different platforms and um, making money off of them or off of their trading inexperiences. Mm -hmm. And this was for me always kind of a reason why I felt like, man, this market is going crazy. And this Shiba Inu stuff, for me, it's, it goes into a, a similar direction, but I would love to hear your opinion. Are you thinking about like exiting everything or just saying, well, I will take out the majority? Yeah, uh, I'm thinking about majority, never everything. I mean, you you never know how crazy. I mean, I, I think of it like that way, that this time is not different than the other times. And we are almost at the peak. When I say almost, I think it could still double, which, mm-hmm. but when it does, it does it really quickly. Uh, I look at the Bitcoin price, um, even though I don't really have much Bitcoin, but I think it's a good indicator. And if it goes to 90K, I would definitely sell like 70, 80% of all my stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I would keep the rest because you never know if there's like a super cycle, right? I mean, it could be, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this time could be different. Um, But then I would just go back in after it crashed. And when everything died down and everybody is a little bit more um, down to earth, then I would just enter again because I want to stay in the space and I want to continue on these podcast episodes and... Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fun space and it will grow. We will continue mm-hmm. to grow. I mean, I believe in the space, but just in the cycle, I feel we might be close to uh, a top again. Um, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I'm I'm not sure, to be honest. I mean, I, I doubt myself all the time. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm also not sure. The, the, the thing is, when people ask me, yeah, should I exit the market? And, and you know, it, this is a top signal and everyone is in meme coins and this and that. My question is always, okay, exit into what? If mm-hmm. you cannot answer this question, because, I mean, look at the stock market. The stock market is just as crazy. Yeah, the numbers are a bit lower, but comparing revenue numbers and profit numbers to company valuations is still very crazy. So, mm-hmm. and, and same with real estate. I'm not a real estate expert, but from my understanding, real estate prices are super high. Um, and I'm definitely not going to invest into gold or anything. So, I mean, <laughs> not, not a big amount at least. So I don't see kind of an alternative. Um, and of course, if you hold cash, you're, excuse me, you're dumb, right? Like everyone throws this at you saying, oh yeah, but inflation will eat up your money, um, which I don't always agree with. It just gives you flexibility to move into, into different opportunities. But um, that's kind of... When in, in this crypto space, it's 24-7 and you're getting bombarded with different messages 24-7. Super cycle today, tomorrow is we're all going to be broke again and nobody's going to make it and this and that and we're done and super cycle is over. Three-year three, three year bear market starting right now. So it's very mm-hmm. difficult for people to really differentiate and understand where we are in the cycle. So even like what happened yesterday, there was a correction, but a meme coin went up. Is this and this is usually not a top signal. The, the top mm-hmm. signal is usually when everything goes up, but the meme coins go up as well. So it's it's mm-hmm. very difficult to to estimate where we are in the market. But the question is again, where do we exit to if we want to mm-hmm. exit? And I also believe, uh, and it would would be interesting to hear your opinion on that. But I think even if there's a crash, it, it won't be the same crazy crash as we, we used to have in 2017. I mean, it literally went Ethereum held to $1,300, $2,400 and went down to the lowest point to $99, right? Or $80, mm-hmm. I don't know 80, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So really a, and a, a super long kind of like uh, draining of the market, right? It was super brutal. And I don't think it would go that far down because nowadays there's just other companies who would 
jump in and say, hey, we still believe nothing has changed. Ethereum is still here. Um, mm. Let's buy at 2000. I don't know. Mm. I don't think it would go that crazy. But the, or the f- how do you think about that? Yeah, I think so too. I mean, we all we all said this time it's different, but then in May what happened was like an almost 40% correction, right? So it's still, mm-hmm. it's still scary. I think it's, I mean, to be honest, and, and we discussed this with Kevin on the podcast as well. If this is your first rodeo, if you invested beginning of May, by the end of May, you were looking at a portfolio that was deep in the red and you were really, really scared. For us, this was just a very bad afternoon. Like we we would forget this in the next day because we have seen so many crazy cycles, like crazy cycles up, but also crazy cycles down that for us, this is pretty normal. And if you're a long-term investor, you have to be able to stomach these uh, volatility things, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now, the, the, the thing is, for, for, for me, uh, when when it comes to uh, prices or price discussions, what I really like the statement from the Yearn founder and uh, developer on Phantom, on Andre Crony, I think he's called. Mm-hmm. Um, he wrote a blog post saying that bear markets are great for development because in bull markets, everyone is focused on the price and nobody is focused on the product and the developments and so on. So everyone is, is talking about when token, when airdrop, when uh, price go up and this and that. But in bear markets, only the really core people who believe in the technology um, and and believe in this being the future are actually building, be it with content, be it with code, be it with uh, education and so on, um, are are keeping on. And I feel like Mm -hmm. this um, market corrections also help us with uh, flush out the bad actors in the system as bad as it sounds in my opinion some meme coin investors shouldn't be in the markets right now because they will get burned but i cannot save everyone i try my best to to educate people but like i said if people want to invest in meme coins they should they just shouldn't mm. do that with 99 percent of their net worth <laughs> that that's for sure that's mm. clear and uh... Um, I agree with you that that the, maybe there is a, a way of investing smartly in them because the upside is crazy. I mean, the Shinu Ibu, if, if you would have been in that, right? I mean, that's probably the best performing asset in the world, maybe after Bitcoin. Uh, I heard like, I don't know, if you invest like 1,000, people have made billions, which is absolutely crazy, but nobody holds mm-hmm. that long. I. I mean, I can tell you a Shiba Inu story that that keeps me sometimes up at night. Um, okay. <laughs> so a friend of a friend, I don't know him personally, but it's a very good friend. So I believe in, in what he says and he showed me the wallet, etc. His friend bought Shiba Inu, I think, at the beginning of the year, either January or February. I'm not completely sure. Um, he invested 400 bucks or 700 bucks, I think, into Shiba Inu. And um, he's currently sitting on 2.2 million. Um, That's crazy. This is, and my friend showed me another wallet of a guy investing a couple of bucks or maybe I think 8,000 and he's sitting on 5.3 billion US dollars right now. Um, this is arguably can probably the... Exit? Can you yeah, sell you, 5.3 billion without... Exactly. That, that was my next question. But I can tell you that the guy who sits on 2.2 million already took out 1.3. So he already cashed out without the market like going crazy. And I'm I'm sometimes, and people have to understand this, we're sitting here analyzing coins, talking to influencers, understanding protocols, and really spending time educating people and understanding the markets. And somebody's coming and buying $400 worth of meme coins and making seven figures in what, in three months, in six months, something like this. This is the market craziness we're in. Now, um do i resent this in any kind of way sometimes i i see it very similar to you as in it can give the the industry a bad rep and and i think Mm. this is the main issue because exactly these people who didn't cash out when they had so much money but crashed and burned and lost their savings or their rent money or this and that will be the people saying that crypto is a scam and mm-hmm. this for me is is a huge problem because um, we're spending so much time educating people and trying to see behind the scenes, behind the people, behind the protocols and all of these things. 
And um, this hype is happening next to us. Some people are getting crazy rich. Some people are losing a lot of money. And um, all of the work we have done is essentially then done for nothing. If you look at it from a negative perspective, I try to look at things in a positive way, an optimistic way, but this is the market we're in. At the same mm -hmm. time, it is a market where with an investment of, um, I mean, I, I remember when, when we talked with Kevin about the Fidenzas, the Fidenza price was about four to five Ethereum. That back mm -hmm. then, I think was around 10 to 12,000 US dollars. Yeah. And just as a and reminder, the Fidenza is an NFT project, which is like a beautiful artwork, uh, algorithmically done. Um, kind of these stripes and dots, oh, mm -hmm. ma more, mainly shaped stripes. Yeah, it's, it's very beautiful. I, I like it a lot. Yeah, sorry. And literally, this is what I said in the podcast. I said, look, I don't understand a lot of the generative art in the NFT space, but this is looking really nice. This is something I would hang up on my wall if um, I would have a Fidenza. I looked at the Fidenza, I didn't buy uh, because I, I felt like it was crazy to spend 10,000 US dollars on an NFT that was generatively produced. Fast forward two months or three months and Fidenzas are getting sold for three digit ETH numbers. So multiple mm -hmm. millions are being made with Fidenzas. I think the floor is still somewhere in the hundreds of ETH. Um, I might be wrong there, but I think it's in the hundreds. And um, so you could have made a million out of 10,000 US dollar. And the cool thing about this is where else in what industry do you have opportunities like this where you can learn, where you can make a huge mistake, um, not buy in, but still have a ton of opportunities in front of you. And I don't know any other industry that gives you this. So that's why I tell people, don't look back at mistakes or the, the trades that you took wrongly or something. Just try to focus on what's in front of you and try to focus on the next opportunity. Mm -hmm. And these kind of stories we tell each other, what, what, what you just told me is like a story, it's an anecdote. I assume you're analyzing quite methodologically, right? Those kind of projects. You maybe have a system that you, that you, that you use to analyze coins and NFTs, etc. Mm -hmm. But most people learn just by telling stories, just as we did right now. Um, now, as the things you learned in this cycle, let's assume there is a crash and a new cycle coming. Mm -hmm. How would you apply that smartly for the next one you know probably one learning for me is just keep an open mind for everything that's coming along the next thing mm -hmm. that you would dismiss usually just look at it a little bit more deeply and maybe you know put a hundred bucks in it just is is that how you do it as well or do, do you have another system no i think this this sums it up pretty nicely be open and don't um dismiss new projects, new coins, new ideas, new um, ways of doing things. I mean, NFTs at the beginning of the year, and this is a huge mistake from my side as well. I missed the entire NFT run between January and March when NFTs were the hottest thing in the market. I dismissed it for being just a joke. But this is exactly, for example, at the time where I could have bought into CryptoPunks, but I missed it. Like they were much, much cheaper back then. But through Kevin, for example, I learned a lot about the NFT market, the artists behind it and why it's interesting, why, how it's working, the dynamics and so on. So I think being open, and I try to tell this when I meet bankers or I meet people from the finance space who... I gave a lecture two weeks ago or one week ago, and in the second part of the lecture, um, one of the questions was when, when I explained to them how DeFi works, and I, I think I talked about Aave and all of these different DeFi protocols, um, one of the questions was, isn't this just a Ponzi scheme? Like, won't these yields go down and it will be just, um, and in German, we have this word called the Schneeball system. So a snowball kind of rolling up and, or a snowball system where somebody gets, gets, um, gets hurt at the end, right? Like financially. And for me, this was just very indicative of how people look at this market and think like when you're trying to find a scam everywhere, you miss so many opportunities because you are, you have so such a strong doubt sensor that you miss the positive things as well. And I think this is a huge learning for me as well. Like I laughed at NFTs in January, but I made money with NFTs in June. And this is thanks to me being open about the technology and not dismissing it in any way. 
I mean, people still make jokes about NFTs saying, oh, right, click, save. Okay, and now I have your NFT, haha, <laughs> this, that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, you also don't do that with a Picasso. You don't own a Picasso by just right click and saving it. And so why is this so different? Like, why wouldn't you spend 30 minutes trying to understand the technology, trying to understand the market dynamics um, and, and uh, profiting from it, like seeing an opportunity, maybe taking part. Um, it doesn't always have to be profit in terms of money, but also kind of being part of a community and understanding and building something versus just tearing down. I think this is, this is super important. Hmm. And I think uh, what you just mentioned, the keyword community is super it's just a, like a red line going through the whole um, crypto universe. When you think about it, like the L1s, Bitcoin, um, it is held up by a community of believers, uh, builders, obviously, but also believers. Then Ethereum and then stuff built on top of Ethereum or other L1s like um, NFTs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost like um, when you buy a board ape, yacht club ape, Right, which which I don't have, and uh, totally miss that boat as well. By the way, um, then on Twitter you are kind of in a in a club because you can show I am one of you, and people are obviously today are apparently willing to pay hundred k or something like that to be part of that club, to be part of this community, and you are building a community, and it costs only hundred fifty euros. I think it's way too cheap. Don't you think, uh, like, with the value you're providing, that people uh, would be willing to pay much more? Maybe make an NFT. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. G give an exclusive membership. Um, <laughs> no, I think I think it is it is cheap. I think um, I, I actually I do increase the prices regularly. So uh, first it was a monthly fee, then it was a yearly fee. Now I have increased the yearly fee and I will increase it again. As soon as I see that the quality of, um, let's say the quantity of people is higher than the quality of people, for me, it is time to kind of readjust the community because it's super difficult to grow a community and, and make it valuable for, for all the members. And whenever the price of Bitcoin goes up, the number of subscriptions goes up as well into the community. Um, so it goes almost hand in hand. And you can see the people who are very new to this industry that are joining with hype cycles. And these are not the, the same people that participate when the prices are down. However, the mm -hmm. community has built or that we're trying to build and, and uh, are building, and we have uh, so many like core users that were either invested since 2017 or just started in 2021. They have six, seven figure portfolios. Um, they made money, they lost money. Um, they sometimes are degen, they're aping into coins, but they also know when to stop and when not to stop. So I think the community building aspect is super important. That's, that's also something I'm focused on. And I have help from a community manager as well. That, that was all, also part of the community, by the way, I hired within the community. Um, I think this, is, this was super helpful to kind of um, make sure that the community gives value to its members. I mean, it's not just me thinking that I am talking into a camera in either my home or in my office and thousands of people listen to me and appreciate my opinion we always have to remember that this is uh, this is not the usual thing like when i talk to university students or when i think about giving a class in university i maybe teach 20 50 or 100 people at max I reach more people with my podcast or more people with my YouTube videos by doing a video and explaining something that I really enjoy. So for me, the community aspect is not, um, it's not a given, hence why I don't want to have the entry price super high so that only the rich people can come in, uh, but rather that people who are interesting can provide interesting insights do come in. So there is a hurdle of a price, but it's not too high but it will be slowly increasing as well. Inflation, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and what is it um, that you can expect in such a community? I I'm not part of the community, but I know that there's, I think, a Discord where people can talk to each mm -hmm. other. Um, you have some, 
I think the videos that you produce a coin, um, mm-hmm. anal- you know, anal- analyzing coins, but mm-hmm. these are available for everyone, I believe, right? Um, or uh, no. with a so, delay. So the system is that, that on the public YouTube channel and the podcast, I analyze coins that are mostly well known. So in the top 50 or top 100 in terms of market capitalization. So the YouTube community is voting on a coin and I analyze it. And this is kind of the, the, type of analysis I'm doing to introduce people to my style and my content and so on. The paid community or the paid membership includes an access to a Discord group that has very uh, many different channels such as DeFi, NFTs, meme coins, hardware, investments, other investments and so on, where um, people are pretty much around the clock are discussing different things, but are also asking a lot. So it's a more it's it's a lot of uh, also supportive community where you can ask stuff. If you're unsure, if you have a technical issue, for example, what what we've experienced a lot is as well that people are getting uh, into different Discord groups and Telegram groups and some people DM and message them directly saying, look, um, we saw you have a support question. I can help you just share your screen or share your MetaMask details with me and I will help you. This is your typical, yeah, this is your typical (laughs) Discord Telegram uh, scam mm-hmm. right so yeah. people have asked in our discord group guys i've been um contacted by this and that person looks like an admin is this okay to do and immediately people jumped in and said no don't share anything it's all good we will help you and then we help this person to secure their funds so this mm-hmm. this is something that is really really important for me that people can avoid scams as well so this is the community part And in the community part, um, what you also get is once a week, you get um, an analysis of a coin or a token that is super unknown, can be sub 50 million market caps and can be sub uh, $5 million uh, market cap, maybe a super unknown coin that I'm observing, maybe an NFT project that I think is interesting. So they are paying a bit for this, having this edge. And these videos never make it to the public channel or to the public podcast. So it's always this private group of people that are willing to invest, that are uh, looking to invest into different projects, but are aware that these projects sometimes are also a bit more riskier than having uh, invested into number four in in terms of market capitalization. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it before, you you said some people have six figure, seven figure portfolios. How do, how do you know that? What, what, how do you, um, what kind of, or what are other kind of characteristics, demographics, uh, etc.? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, mostly, it's older than you would expect. Um, I always expect that people coming from YouTube or podcast are usually between twenty and thirty, or twenty and thirty-five. Maybe young professionals, maybe students as well, or maybe working people um, who are looking for for this mega investment for the next 100x but it's actually a bit older so usually it's between 40 and 50 years of age they have invested into the financial markets they have a a real estate portfolio sometimes and they read about bitcoin or crypto in the news and wanted to build like a, a more sophisticated view on the market to understand where they can invest and so on so it's it's um these type of people Obviously, we also have younger people, but the majority is still older than you would expect, um, in my opinion. And um, how do I know their portfolio size? Because they tell me um, and they tell and they share within the community. For example, we've had um, last year or, or about six, seven months ago, a guy shared with, with us his thesis on Theta and Theta Fuel and this project that is a streaming solution and so on. Mm -hmm. He invested into Theta after my analysis. He went in with a bigger amount, like 10,000 or something. By the end of this crazy Theta run, and you remember Theta is, I think, the best performing coin of last year. Um, He was sitting on 1.6 million US dollars, I think equivalent. He was still holding this, uh, mainly because uh, tax reasons. And taxes, for example, is something else that we discuss, which is especially for the German community, quite an important topic. So um, he shared that he holds that many 
and that he intends to sell a part, but he believes in it because this is coming and that is coming. So he shared part of the roadmap and so on. So um, we're, we're super thankful for people who are open and sharing these portfolio numbers because other people can then learn as well and understand that, look, a 10,000 US dollar investment can have 100x. You can have that, but you have to be super focused on that one investment. That's another thing. A lot of people tend to invest into 20 different coins um, and it would be a much better strategy to invest into three um, and then go in a bit bigger in terms of sizing. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. And I, I imagine this is also quite a responsibility. I mean, um, and you mentioned it before that you 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 know you want to have quality people in the community mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um that it's not getting kind of hijacked by by people who go in there and you know have different views different uh strategies i mean that's fine to have different views i guess but what would happen i mean how is your your relationship in in that community to the other people are you just a peer or are you kind of like you know a father figure so to say a little bit somebody you they look up to at, or if they're older uh, than you, then it might be a, a different dynamic. How 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 is that going? I, 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 that I think be... yeah, I think father figures is a bit too much. I don't think yeah. that that I am this type of person, but I think I'm a guide. Um, these people respect my opinion because they know that I will give them a no bullshit answer, and I don't want to. Um, extract money from them in any kind of way like in any scammy way like it's it's essentially they are paying for the education that i'm providing for them so it's a fair exchange in in, in my opinion but a lot of people do ask me a lot like what do you think about this coin what do you hold in your portfolio how do you estimate this and that and i try to give an, an educated opinion on all of these things but obviously, I'm, I'm also human. I sometimes make mistakes. And some of the investments we looked at weren't that good of an investment. Um, so for me, it's, it's super important that people make educated investments. And my, um, my position or my role here is to be the educator. Sometimes be a guide, like bring them into the right direction, show them the right site or the right wallet or the right platform. But um, after that, I'm just here to educate because I believe these people are super intelligent and they know what they, they also understand how scams work. Most of the time, it's just sometimes they haven't interacted with the technology such as Discord enough to understand how a scam is built on there. But once they understand and see through it, they help other members as well. So for me, it's super important that educating as transparently and as authentically as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, you you know it the best. I mean, the the space. Even if you have twenty four hours, um, or like you know a whole working week dedicated to it, it's just overwhelming. It's um, DeFi that uh, DeFi on different chains, uh, NFTs, DAOs. Um, I don't know gaming uh, tokens. Um, mm. The next thing we don't even know yet that is going to blow up. How do you go about that? I mean, you mentioned before you have a voting, so people say what you should do next a little mm -hmm. bit, but you already have to choose what to offer them. Um, how do you guide your, you know, like your your work week, so to say, that you don't drown in in projects, that you keep a focus and that especially that you can keep kind of like excitement in that space? Because I can imagine that if you know, it's just getting also a little bit tiring. Um, I feel that myself sometimes just, ah, another thing, another thing, another thing. And the FOMO and the discord groups, um, it's, it's just too much to, 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 to digest. Mm -hmm. Do you have mm -hmm. a strategy that, that helps you to keep focus? I mean, obviously having kind of goals and bigger goals for the community, for my business, and um, also for the revenue, of course, kind of leads my way into where do I put my resources and, and where do I put my focus. But um, to answer your question a bit more specifically, so I think you have to pick your battles a bit. Um, I think even as an investor and, and ideally as a successful investor, you cannot 
in German we say, uh, auf allen Hochzeiten tanzen, right? So you cannot mm. participate in every wedding, um, in, if I translate it one to one. So <laughs> essentially you have to pick your battles, um, have to decide um, where do you want to play? Do you, are you the DeFi guy? Are you the NFT guy? Are you an altcoin analyzer? And so on. Like, where is your edge? Where do you see your advantage in the market? If financial return is your, mm -hmm. your goal, of course, if your goal is to build a community or, or participate in something else. So I think having, like, having a goal, then deciding where your edge is and where your, where your technology expertise or chain expertise is. Like if you're super knowledgeable in the Terra Luna ec ecosystem, and I have, um, I, I've met him virtually as well, and, and we, we talk regularly, Don Kuar, he has a re really good YouTube channel, but he's very focused on the Terra Luna ecosystem. So he knows the ins and outs of Terra Luna. Um, he's not just invested in Luna. Um, he's also invested into other coins and other chains as well, but it ties into his big strategy of um, uh, uh, having Luna as the focus and then maybe Solana and, and maybe other coins as well. And I think how he approaches it is very good that he just, he is not the guy uh, that you would ask about generative art on the Ethereum chain, for example, or he's mm -hmm. not the guy showing you which altcoin uh, on coin market cap number 3000 and something could blow up in this area. He's just a guy who can tell you everything about the Terra Luna ecosystem with a very educated view. And I think having a focus and for investors, this, this is also super important, like focusing on one chain. Are you, like I said, are you focused on Solana? Are you focused on Luna? Are you focused on Phantom? Picking your ecosystem and then trying to understand the ecosystem and then also the industry, like are you more in, into DeFi or NFTs and so on? Mm -hmm. I think this is this is the way I approach it for my personal investment as well. Um, for example, I wasn't in the summer. I missed Avalanche completely. I Not didn't participate <laughs> in in Avalanche whatsoever, but I was busy with NFTs and I was super successful with NFTs. Luckily, um, so it's it's always opportunity cost, always opportunity cost, but ultimately you just have to know where your strengths are. And if you try to um, invest into Avalanche and into a successful NFT, you will just lose out on both ends. So ultimately it it, it won't be as, as helpful for mm -hmm. your portfolio, mm -hmm. let's say. Yeah, no, I, I, get, I get that. I was more wondering or... Um leaning towards because i've been going through your bio in your linkedin and one point mm -hmm. pops out which is totally different from the other ones you worked as product manager for for digital startups but one was one of your side projects which is called by type and mm -hmm. when you go on the website is uh you don't really see much but you apparently it was a blog or something and you wrote articles about the office of the future how to avoid jet lag walk mm -hmm. every day to be more creative and productive so mm -hmm. I figured you may have a little bit this um, self-optimizing, hacking uh, passion mm -hmm. or, or used to have. And I wonder if you have like productivity tips or something like that, how, oh, you, got it. how, you, mm -hmm. how you get so much done and, you know, how, mm -hmm. how you're, well, let's, let's, let's quickly talk about by type. What, what was that? I mean, if, if yeah. you feel comfortable about talking about that, but I think it's interesting. This, it, it gives a little bit of um, nuance to yeah, of course, um, of course. Um, yeah, it was a, a blogging project that I did a couple of years ago. Essentially, first writing about just health and fitness, but then I realized I'm not really super health and fitness uh, focused, but rather how to use health elements such as nutrition and exercise and so on and um, to be more productive at work or at your side job or whatever you want to do. Because what I realized uh, very early is if I want to build a side project into my main project or if I want to build a business or so on, I need to have like extra energy because it's mm. like working eight to 10 hours a day at the day job and then coming home and then working for another two to four hours at your side job. It just, it's super exhausting. So you have to kind of, understand where where your energy is coming from um so fairly early i started really getting into health and, and fitness in general but also with the goal to be more productive a big majority of that is diet and nutrition so i try to mm -hmm. eat as healthy as possible about 80 or 90 percent of the time so at 10 percent of the time i can um, have a cheat meal or eat a pizza or whatever 
Um, that's one part. The other part is exercise, which um, I've been lacking the last four weeks now, <laughs> I, I must be honest. But usually what I do is, and this is also kind of a hack that I found out, is I wake up super early in the morning, like 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning, and I go for a walk. And at the end of the walk, there is this outdoor gym with like pull-up bars and this and that. So I do my work out there and then I walk back. And during the, the walk, I have a backpack with weights in them so that the walk is a bit more, um, how do you say, tougher demanding. to do, let's yeah. say, yeah, more demanding. And during that walk, I listen to a podcast or an audiobook. During the mm -hmm. workout, I listen to music. So it, it just helps me do multiple things at once. And then I come home at like 6.30 or 7, take a shower, and then I'm ready for work. And the good thing is the most important part, which is investing into myself or into my body, is already done. So I can um, check mark this off. I have energy for the entire day. Um, so this is kind of one of the things I do. Meditation is another one uh, that's super important that I try to do as regularly as possible which also helps a lot with the crypto space. I must say, like if you're, if you're like me and you're living on Twitter and Discord and Telegram and, and the, the interwebs, um, you have this tendency to be overwhelmed with all of the things that goes on. And I think meditation is just a great way of um, defragmenting your brain and kind of putting order into, into a chaos. Mm, I totally agree. Uh... I, I I use that one as well from time to time just to to stay focused and to stay mm -hmm. calm in the sea of craziness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now it it took Kevin Rose to connect us somehow. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to connect with people who are already out there? Because there there are people in Zurich in Switzerland that are really cool and interesting people in general. I feel like. It is really tough right now because of COVID, but also, well, I don't know. Do, do you have do you, do you have a good network here um, or like uh, tips how to network in, in in Zurich specifically? I mean, I I can maybe intro you to a partner at Trust Square. He he also knows a lot of people. Maybe he can he can help you as well. Um, But in general, man, I, I was always the, the online kind of guy. I was always mm -hmm. the guy who would DM on Twitter or send an email. Like I remember I got an email from um, Mark Cuban in 2011. Um, he, he answered me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, and Jason Fried and so on and James Altucher and, and all of these guys. Like I was always able to connect with these people quite easily. But the important part is to respect their time. I think this is something mm -hmm. that a lot of people make, uh, make a mistake of. Like if you start your uh, email with, um, hi Jonas, I really like your podcast. Look, my story is this. And then you send them 10 paragraphs telling why you are so cool and so important. And then mm -hmm. at the end asking them, well, Jonas, would you, would you come onto my podcast? This will get deleted and you will never get an answer, but just saying, Hey Jonas, I love what you're doing. My podcast is getting a gazillion downloads a day. Um, would you jump on next Thursday, 2 p.m.? Question mark. Mm -hmm. And That's then you the follow way. up in yeah, and then you follow up in a couple of months as well. And usually this this gets people um, to answer. Another thing that I always used, and you can use this for essentially every every person, is to have a hook with that person. So for example, if that person just wrote a really interesting blog post or a podcast, you can tell them, for example, hey, Kevin, just listen to the podcast episode with DC Investor, really liked your take on Fidenzas. Um, would you jump onto a podcast with me to talk Fidenza next mm -hmm. Tuesday, 2 p.m., something like this? I think this mm -hmm. could something be very a specific. way. specific. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actionable, not, uh, okay, yeah. And where can people find you online or a call to action? What should people do? They, they, they listen to this podcast. I think this guy is cool. I want to be part of his community. I don't, I don't speak German probably, or maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> We can also have two call to actions for people who, who are German speakers and for other ones. Yeah, I think the best uh, way of, of either following me and my ideas and projects is on Twitter at FreshFay. And if you're a German speaker, of course, bluealpineresearch.com or on a podcast, crypto podcast, or on YouTube, it's also Crypto Analysen. So um, if you're a German speaker, I would love to have you obviously in my community. 
Um, and if you're an English speaker, we'll probably see each other on the interwebs, on Twitter and so on. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. If you are still listening, chances are that you liked this episode. DeFi is not just me, it's also you, the listener. And growing this podcast is seriously one of the toughest challenges I've ever undertaken. It's so hard to grow an audience. But each day, there are more listeners joining and together we can spread the word about DeFi. By giving it five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening. Send this episode to a friend who might be interested. Check out the website, visit defire.money and click on subscribe to get the new episodes and in the future also blog posts directly into your inbox. Also make sure to follow me on Twitter at defiremoney. All of this helps so we can continue to produce more episodes more frequently and get the most interesting guests that you deserve. The music in this episode is from Young Cards and the signature sound is from Verified Picasso. Good night and see you soon.